Now all the day I was looking at the program and these were really heavy duty, thinking, rational. So you must be walking like this with one part of the brain very heavy. So you will have to shift to the aesthetic side of the brain uh, just now. And I hope it doesn't cause you too much, uh, uh, too much effort. I'm sure not uh, because after all this heavy duty, I think you need some entertainment for the evening, which is, this, which is I think the public lecture. This is the 150th year of the birth year of Tagore. And uh, so I think the Indian Association of Science meeting and this 150th year combined very well for this talk. Now, I'm not a scholar of Rabindranath Tagore, nor have I any expertise in matters relating to art. Along with many others, I truly believe that there's an ultimate mystery at the heart of great art a beauty that can all too easily vanish if we seek to understand it too quickly and too easily. I am also cautioned by the painter himself, and Tagore wrote of his paintings, I quote him, people often ask me about the meaning of my pictures. I remain silent, even as my pictures are. It is for them to express and not to explain. And at another place, I have nothing to say about my pictures. I do not really know what I've done or wanted to say. It would thus be presumptuous of me to try and explain Rabindranath's pictures in any authoritative fashion. All I can do here is to try and capture a glimpse of the mysterious creativity of his paintings through the impressions they have left on my own psyche. In other words, it is not any scholarly apparatus, but my own psyche, which is the primary source of my observations. My own subconscious, with which I seek to understand the subconscious in Rabindranath's paintings. I thus promise to be hopelessly subjective as I attempt to answer a question the surrealist André Breton asked in a different context. To me, a picture is a window that looks out on something. The question is, on what? So my task today is to muse together with you on the question, what do Rabindranath's paintings look out on? Given his reputation, based on his literary output, especially his poems and songs, of being a highly spiritual person, it would be easy to claim that the creativity Rabindranath displays in his art is fundamentally spiritual. This will not be erroneous, at least as far as some of his landscapes are concerned. These landscapes are indeed like many of his poems, meditative, simultaneously looking in and looking out. They recapture young Rabindranath's moments of quasi-mystical absorption in nature, such as when he writes in a letter, I think he was around 20 years old, and I quote him, shining expanse of river, the blur of shade thrown by the dark fringe of trees along its edge and the white sky gleaming overhead in uncontrolled aloofness. Of these moments, of which he wrote so eloquently, when traveling through the Bengal countryside in his late twenties, he says, and I quote him, My feelings seem to be those of our ancient earth in the daily ecstasy of its sun-kissed life. My own unconscious seems to stream through each blade of grass, each sucking root, to rise with the sap through the trees, to break out with joyous thrills in the waving fields of corn, in the rustling palm leaves. I feel impelled to give expression to my blood tie with the earth, my kinsman love for her, but I'm afraid I shall not be understood. I believe it is significant that when in September 1937, Rabindranath was in coma for 60 hours and almost died. His first creative act on coming back from the borderland between life and death was to ask for colors and a brush and paint a landscape. Dark trees outlined against a ghostly twilight beneath which glimmered irregular patches of white light with hint of palest yellow. His landscapes in which Tagore seems to try to recapture, as he said, his blood tie with the earth, the painter is gazing upon, gazing into nature 
with such an empathy, Sahirdaya, that he seems to be connecting with the universe itself. For spiritual to me primarily means an omnipresence of empathy, of a deep feeling of connectedness. We are most divine when we are at our most empathetic. Perhaps only a few rare saints can reach the summit of empathy expressed in the Upanishadic ideal of he who sees all beings in his own self and his own self in all beings. Most of us can consider ourselves fortunate if we can catch a glimpse of the peak from the base camp of an all-encompassing compassion that is so evident in Rabindranath's literary work, his songs and some of his paintings. This view on the spiritual nature of his creativity and indeed of all artistic creativity will not only have the influential support from theorists of Indian aesthetics, from Abhinav Gupta to Ananda Kumaraswamy, but has also been articulated by many European artists, including influential modernists. As is evident from the catalogue of the exhibition, Traces of the Spiritual, in Santre Pompidou in Paris in 2000, and I quote, to touch, refine, and enrich the soul, the spirit, has become a central concern for many artists today. They believe that one of the highest skills of the artistic profession is the ability to summon a vision of the divine without sentimentality, a secular divine. This secular divine, as I've said, for me, is Sahardaya, an all-encompassing empathy. Writers, too, have described the creative process where the sense of individual agency disappears in a connectedness, in a fusion with the subject. Gustave Flaubert, while writing Madame Bovary, confides to a friend, and I quote, it is a delicious thing to write, to be no longer yourself, but to move in an entire universe of your own creating. Today, for instance, as a man and a woman, both lover and mistress, I wrote into a forest of an autumn afternoon under the yellow leaves and I was also the horses, the leaves, the wind, the words my people uttered, even the red sun that made them close their loved round eyes. This is the literary equivalent of a painter meditating before the canvas or if you do not like the word meditating then dreaming before the canvas. Someone like Paul Gauguin who believed in what he called dreaming while fully awake before nature and now before the canvas, letting the dreams suggest the painting and translating of the feeling into visual terms. <clears throat> Yet, excluding some of the landscapes, my abiding impression of the bulk of Rabindranath's paintings is that, that spirituality does not lie in their inspiration, but in their execution. If in Kumara Swami's terms, Artistic creativity is a two-step yoga, comprising one, of a meditative stance, mindfulness, and two, of skilled execution, then the yoga of Rabindranath's paintings lies in their execution. The painter himself recognizes this particularity when he writes in a letter, and I quote him, the subject matter of a poem can be traced back to some dim thought in the mind, while painting the process adopted by, by me is quite the reverse. First, there's a hint of a line. Then the line becomes a form. The more pronounced the form, the clearer becomes the picture of my conception. This creation of form is an endless wonder. The spiritual aspect of Rabindranath's art, especially in the landscapes, is thus not that of a meditating monk, but the arrow maker who is often brought up in Indian philosophical texts as the proverbial instance of mindfulness, of skilled execution. Thus, Shankaracharya, one of our greatest Indian philosophers, singles out, and I quote him, the arrow maker who perceives nothing beyond his work when he's buried in it. At the beginning of this talk, I said that I will not dispute the presence of the spiritual in Rabindranath's artistic creativity a spirituality that is even more marked in his poems and songs. Yet, there's another source of his creativity in both his poems and paintings, which we need to explore further. 
If I may use the metaphor of the lotus as the symbol of creativity, a flower which opens to light and sun, symbolizing the spiritual, the light and sun symbolizing the spiritual, then we also need to remember that the lotus grows in mud, the symbol of the subconscious. And although influential mystics such as Sri Aurobindo have tended to look down on mud, as he says, one cannot discover the meaning of the lotus by analyzing the secrets of the mud in which grows, I would still maintain that the flowering of the lotus needs the mud, mud as much as it needs light and sun, the subconscious as much as the spiritual. The mud is not dirt, but as a mix of the elements of earth and water, it is also the ground of creativity from which it soars into air and akash, two other elements in the Panch Bhuta of all creation, animate and inanimate. inanimate. Personally, I do not fully subscribe to either the spiritual or the subconscious views on origins of artistic creativity, but prefer to believe that creativity partakes of both, that it courses through the stem between the mud and the flower. What is this subconscious, which constitutes more than 95% of our mental life and is hidden from our consciousness, which has little or no insight into so many of motivations that underlie our wishes and actions. Much of this subconscious consists of automatic processes of which we are not necessarily aware. We talk, see, hear, walk automatically, react automatically to most situations and make our emotional judgments from the heart than from the head. But the subconscious that I'm talking of are the major themes in a person's life that have been shaped by his childhood and youth direct the course of the person's life and are repeated throughout the life cycle. <clears throat> Insights dawn and are more often one's lot when the work is but a subconscious continuation of one's inner theater, of one's biography in another register. In case of an artist, I would say that whatever conscious notions that he, she may have about what she wishes to happen on the canvas Less conscious currents of feeling thought that comprise the major theme of his life also influence what takes shape. In other words, what I'm saying is that Rabindranath's paintings are also shapes of his early subconscious feelings, which he recaptures and transforms in the present through his art. This psychoanalytic approach to understanding art has limitations because of the wide variety in the works of art. It works best with artists like Edward Munch and Pablo Picasso, and in our country, M.F. Hussein and F.N. Souza, for instance, who have poured their personal lives into their work and offer abundant material for responsible psychoanalytic exploration. As we shall see later, I count Rabindranath among this group. The approach will not easily work in case of artists who work in a tradition that emphasizes faithfulness to a well-defined iconography and technique. These artists subordinate the personal in the service of an aesthetic or a religious ideal, and the personal subconscious, though present in the artwork, will be difficult to detect. It will also be difficult, though not impossible, to detect subconscious biographical themes in the work of many modern painters, where the narrative content of the painting its subject is completely subordinated to its purely visual or formal elements, the arrangement of its lines, shapes, and colors. Of course, it is this visual music, the emotion of form, which turns the emotion of content in a painting into a work of art. But if this formal abstract music is overpoweringly loud, it becomes difficult to hear the major subconscious themes of the artist's life story. Rabindranath is a modernist and now widely regarded as the father of modern Indian painting precisely because he recognizes that his paintings are animated by the music of form, which he calls rhythm. As he says, one thing which is common to all arts is the principle of rhythm, which transforms inert materials into living creations. My instinct for it and my training in its use 
led me to know that lines and colors in art are no carriers of information. They seek their rhythmic incarnation in space. <clears throat> in pictures, regarding his correct, corrective drawings in his manuscript, some are here, he writes, I tried to, to make my corrections dance, connect them in a rhythmic relationship and transform accumulation into adornment. And at another place, in my case, my pictures did not have their origin in trained discipline, in tradition and deliberate attempt at illustration, but in my instinct for rhythm, my pleasure in harmonious combination of lines and colors. Yet Rabindranath's paintings, especially his portraits, have enough of narrative content to let me look out into his subconscious inner life, its dominant themes having their origins in his early childhood years, which are then repeated again and again during the course of his long life, as they are repeated in all our lives. For this purpose, we will need at least a nodding acquaintance with Rabindranath's biography, especially his childhood and early youth, which are of special interest to the psychoanalyst. <coughs> Rabindranath Tagore was the youngest living child of 13 siblings of a wealthy and prominent family of Kolkata who were pioneers of the Bengal Renaissance that tried to combine traditional Indian culture with Western ideas. It was a highly artistic family whose creative energies flowed into many channels music, literature, drama, and later into art. His father, Dibindranath Tagore, was an accomplished musician as well as a scholar and religious reformer who had converted to the Brahmo Samaj. He traveled a great deal and was rarely at home. Robi's mother, Sharda Devi, died when the child was young. Growing up in the vast, sprawling mansion in Jorasanko, in the midst of great wealth and culture, and although surrounded by a busy, extended family life, Roby was a lonely child who was mainly brought up by poor and ignorant servants who were physically abusive. Later, he was to refer to his childhood as his days under servocracy. Although he loved nature and outdoors, the highly imaginative boy led a very restricted life in his living quarters where he looked longingly out through the windows at the greenery, flowers and trees in the garden, birds in the sky. In short, the freedom of nature. One servant in charge of Roby, for instance, tried to keep the boy from exploring the outdoors by keeping him within a circle drawn in the ground. Kind of a Lakshman Rekha there. The feeling of loneliness and being confined were exacerbated by the fact that he refused to go to school after class five and was educated at home by tutors. Following the example of many of his elder brothers who were educated in England, Rabindranath did go to England when he was 17 to study law and train as a barrister, but returned after one and a half years without finishing his studies. Rabindranath's one intimate companion in the years of his childhood and early youth till his marriage at the age of 22 was his sister-in-law, Kadambri Devi, the wife of a much older Jyotindranath. Kadambri came to Tagore's household as a nine-year-old child bride, two years older than Robi, and shared her childhood and adolescence with him. They played together, read together, sang together, creating a two-person universe for themselves. Kadambri committed suicide four months after Rabindranath's marriage at the age of 22. I will come back to this later. As we know, Rabindranath came to painting late, when he was almost 70 years old. The immediate precursor of his paintings were the Puravi poems, which he wrote during an ocean crossing from Sherbrooke to Buenos Aires. During the voyage, we are told, he was violently ill and his mind was Quote, despondent with the saddest thoughts of the tragedy of love and death. With the weakening of the normal psychological defenses that keep, that keep a lid on the cauldron of our subconscious impulses, 
the cut-off parts of the self bubbled up through many lines in the first drafts of these poems, which Rabindranath then erased and formed into shapes he called apparitions of non-deliberate origin. <clears throat> in one poem, he directly refers to these drawings. Quote him, Hark, where in the formless limbs, ghosts of sights and weepings haunt the night. A time was when they had a form and a voice. The fruitless sorrow of all that has been and is now nameless, amorphous, unremembered, haunt the dim recesses of my mind, seeking a form, a shelter. Not that he had not earlier used the same technique of erasing lines from poems and transforming the erasures into rhythmic visual shapes. But as Sheetish Roy perceptively observes, the important difference now is that while the earlier erasures mostly assumed delicately floriated or vine-like patterns, the one of Purvi poems often show an orgy of violent forms, grotesque and primitive shapes that are almost in conflict with the words and the lines and at times very near obliterating a whole stanza or a complete poem. From Purvi onwards, under a greater pressure from subconscious promptings, poetry recedes and painting comes more and more to the fore. The poet Tagore cedes his place to the painter Rabindranath. From the same letter from which I quoted earlier, he writes, the most important item in the bulletin of my daily news is my painting. I'm hopelessly entangled in the spell that the lines have cast all around me. I've almost managed to forget that there used to be a time when I wrote poetry. Is painting, the psychoanalyst here, or I would ask, more therapeutic than poetry in a situation where the balance between the mud and the sun has shifted in favor of the former, in favor of the mud? My tentative answer is yes. In the last stage of his life, old age, when cut off parts of the self once again demand a hearing before life comes to a close, when the unlived or unresolved issues of earlier stages of life again come to the fore, bringing the connected emotions of guilt, anxiety, and depression in their wake, the wisdom we often attribute to the old and believe we see reflected on their faces often masks the cry of an old person's despairing heart. What had marked Rabindranath's, Rabindranath's life so far was the theme of unity that not only ran through his poetry and other writings, but also constituted the dominant strand of his inner life. The attempt to recreate a unity, a wholeness unmarked by differences, a synthesis of opposites, is of course not unique to Rabindranath, but is true of all genuinely creative individuals. Generally though, the focus has been on the unity of male and female elements. Eminent artists of both genders almost universally profess that androgyny is critical to artistic productivity. They assert that every artist is androgynous. It is the masculine in a woman and the feminine in a man that proves creative. English poet Samuel Coleridge writes, the great mind must be androgynous. And Virginia Woolf, the no writer, novelist, writes, some collaboration has to take place in the mind between a woman and man before the act of creation can be accomplished. Some marriage of opposites has to be consummated. This androgyny is not absent in Tagore's creative output. Indeed, it is a marked feature of his head studies. In the 12 self-portraits he created by colored doodles on the black and white photograph of himself, one is a woman while the gender of yet another cannot be determined. The integration of the masculine and feminine is not only true of his art, but also of his person. As my own teacher Eric Erickson has observed in an unpublished essay on Tagore, in fact, which he gave here in 1963 in the seminar in retreat. Some express this androgyny only in their poetry, some in their appearance as well. And Tagore's whole appearance at the end 
seem to be above the sexes. Even as in young years, he combined feminine shyness with a tall masculine body. His beard was patriarchal, but his robes veiled some mysteriously pregnant body. Ascetic Gandhi was tolerant of this flamboyant appearance. He understood that it marked Tagore's role in India and the world. For in a country smitten by the necessity to stand up against a conqueror's idol, namely the masculinity of British beef eaters, and in a world about to surrender to a combination of technological supermen and nationalist bullies, Tagore reasserted the traditional inclusion in the Indian identity of the feminine and the maternal, the sensual and the experiential, the receptive and the transcendent in human life. Tagore's search for unity in his art was wider than that of fusion of the masculine and feminine aspects of his psyche. His endeavor was also to bring together other dualities, eternal and mortal, human, divine, India, West, home, world, Gare, Bere. In Tagore's life, the unity theme can be traced back to the geography of his childhood. Here, imprisoned on the fringe of the big house, the fringe where the people, the servants, sister-in-law Kadambri, the teachers dwell, the child Rabindranath Tagore, Rabindranath longs for the mysterious inner sanctum, his mother's quarters, her scent and immersion in the maternal, as also for the great outer world of the returning father, the inspiration of nature, the merger with the great spirit. The two basic moods of unity, sadness because the union is prevented by death and rapture when the union does take place are pervasive in Rabindranath's poetry. In his paintings though, especially in his many female portraits, the predominant mood is of sadness, or I would go further, of melancholy. Rabindranath is well aware of the depressive mood of these paintings. I quote him, the picture has about it a sense of brooding melancholy. Don't you notice it? Most of my pictures are like that. They lack laughter. I do not know why this should be, when I like a good laugh myself and love to make others laugh. Probably I have a touch of sadness deep down. In their dark colors, profusion of shadows, the expression on their half-covered faces, I see not the sadness of loss, the mourning for a beloved person where the relationship was only positive, but deep down in the subconscious, the melancholy of the loss of a vitally important relationship that was also marked by some ambivalence, where the mourning also has a strain of guilt. Sifting from his paintings to his life, who was this woman, the other half of the important relationship? We are told that in a conversation with Nandlal Bose, Rabindranath said that while drawing the female face, he is reminded of his sister-in-law, Kadambri Devi. And I quote, the look of the eyes of Natun Bhutan, as he called her, have become so deeply imprinted on my mind that I can never forget them. And when I paint portraits, quite often her glowing eyes present themselves before my sight. Probably that is why the eyes in my portraits take after her eyes. He had composed a celebrated song in her memory, Noino Shomuke Tumi Nai. You appear not in front of my eyes, yet you have found a place in the center of my vision. We know that Rabindranath's relationship with Kandamri was the most intimate one of his childhood and early youth. Only four months after Rabindranath's marriage, Kandamri committed suicide. We know from his own testimony that this was a traumatic event in his life. And I quote him, all around, the trees, the soil, the water, the sun, the moon, the stars, remained as immovably true as before. And yet the person who was as truly there, who through a thousand points of contact with life, mind and heart, was so very much more true for me, had vanished in an instant like a dream. To a young Amiya Chakravarti, who would 
a decade or so later become Tagore's literary secretary for a period of time, Tagore wrote in 1917, once when I was about your age, I suffered a devastating sorrow, similar to yours now. A very close relative of mine committed suicide, and she had been my life's total support, right from childhood onward. And so with her unexpected death, it was as if the earth itself receded from beneath my feet, as though the sky above me all went dark, my universe turned empty, my zest for life departed. It was as if Kadambri's death forbade Rabindranath from ever planting another garden of love around him. He would have many friends through his long life, but never admit another human being to deep intimacy. At the age of 63, he confesses in a letter to a friend, I quote him here, I carry an infinite space of loneliness around my soul, through which the voice of my personal life very often does not reach my friends, for which I suffer more than they do. I have my yearning for the personal world as much as any other mortal, or perhaps more. But my destiny seems to be careful that in my life's experiences, I should only have the touch of personality and not the ties of it. In fact, I've constantly been deprived of opportunities for intimate, long-lasting attachments of companionship. Then again, I have such an extreme delicacy of sensitiveness with regards to personal relationship that even when I acknowledge and welcome it, I cannot invite it to the immediate closeness of my life. Death, the final revelation of our essential loneliness, the land to which no one will ever accompany us, became a preoccupation for Rabindranath and he wrote about it frequently. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the author of the widely read and influential On Death and Dying, believed that no one had ever thought more deeply on death than Rabindranath Tagore and printed his quotations at the head of each chapter of a book. Tagore's profound loneliness and inability to form deep ties of attachment is certainly a part of the mud which contributes to but does not wholly account for the flowering of the lotus. The spirit cannot be merely reduced to the workings of human desire and attachment to Eros. T.S. Eliot, the poet, is not always correct when he observes that a man does not join himself with the universe so long as he has anything else to join himself with. One can never know for certain why Kadambri took her own life and although Krishna Kriplani, a biographer and Rabindranath's relative by marriage, tells us not to speculate on the cause of the suicide, as a psychoanalyst, I cannot help but do so. I cannot help but speculate whether Kadambri's suicide and Rabindranath's sudden and unexpected marriage, in words of the biographer, are linked together. I base this speculation on my impressions from clinical practice among Indian middle and upper middle classes, where often a close, intimate relationship develops between the younger brother and the wife of an elder brother, especially if the difference in their ages is small and the wife feels neglected by the husband. I have found that women who are on terms of intimacy with younger brother-in-law experience a strong depressive anxiety that is occasioned by his leaving home or his impending marriage, which the woman perceives as an end to her emotional life. And if this is followed up with a clinical depression or even an attempted suicide, there is little that the brother-in-law can do to avoid conscious or subconscious pangs of guilt. Let me repeat that this is speculation, informed speculation if you will, in itself, speculation, which literally means reconnaissance, is a valuable gift that is too easily dismissed in intellectual discourse. We forget that to speculate, speculari, is to describe something that is not immediately open to view. Not that Kadambri had not displayed depressive tendencies earlier, including a failed suicide attempt, which Rabindranath's biographers have attributed to her childlessness and neglect by the husband Jyotendranath, 
who after failed business ventures spent most of his time at the theater and in company of stage actresses. Even more than in their childhood years, Rabindranath must have now become the sole focus of this young woman's emotional life, of her unmet needs for love and validation as a woman and a person. Satyajit Ray's film Charulata, based on Rabindranath's relationship with Kadambri, perceptively catches the nuances of their relationship during youth. Unmistakably erotic and passionate, though not physically or even consciously <coughs> sexual. It is important to note that I'm not saying that Rabindranath's female portraits are of Kadambri. An artwork does not literally recreate the lost person. It does not effect a direct substitution. What it seeks to do is counteract the melancholia and its feelings of loss and guilt by creatively revisiting the site, or rather sites of loss, which are no longer external, but have become internalized, have, been, have become absorbed in the artist's own self-image. I'm using the plural sites of loss rather than the singular, because there's another loss lurking in the deeper parts of Rabindranath's subconscious, another cut-off part of the self, which too finds an expression in his work even when it is absent from his awareness. This is the death of his mother when he was but a child. Rabindranath's claim in his autobiography that his mother's death did not make a conscious and immediate impression on the child does not tell us anything about the meaning of her death to him, but perhaps this poem of his does. I cannot remember my mother. Only sometimes in the midst of my play, a tune seems to hover above my playthings. The tune of some song that she used to hum <coughs> while rocking my cradle. I cannot remember my mother. But when in the early autumn morning, the smell of the sweet flower floats in the air, the scent of the morning service in the temple comes to me as the scent of my mother. I cannot remember my mother. Only when from my bedroom window, I send my eyes into the blue of the distant sky, I feel that the stillness of my mother gazing on my face has spread all over the sky. The women's faces then are not only of Kadambri, but also of his mother, and in having become a part of his own subconscious self-image of Rabindranath himself. It is striking that the eyes in all the female faces the windows to the soul seem to be of the poet painter himself. I believe that it is in these female portraits, more than any other creative expression, where the mud is most evident. It is in these paintings that Rabindranath sought to ease his subconscious disquiets, reintegrate the cut-off parts of the self from his early life that rose to the surface in his old age. Such attempts at self-healing have been shown to be common in lives of many creative geniuses in the West and indeed have been attested to by the artists themselves. The German poet Rainer Maria Rilke wrote, my work is really nothing but a self-treatment. Similarly, the novelist Graham Greene asserted that, I quote him, writing is a form of therapy. Sometimes I wonder how all those who do not write, compose or paint can manage to escape madness, the melancholia, the panic fear which is inherent in the human situation. The self-healing or the attempt at self-healing is not always successful and artists sometimes exa exaggerate the benefit of their creativity. Thus, although the American poet Sylvia Plath referred to poetry as therapy and the English writer Virginia Woolf relied on her quote, art to keep her head sane, both women committed suicide. Finally, because of my special interest in cultural psychology, I must ask the question, but the creative work is at least a partial attempt to deal with subconscious conflicts, calm the subterranean turbulence of the mud, is a universal phenomenon. I believe it is, although the artists I've quoted here are mainly Western and modern. We have very little of this kind of work on Indian artists. In fact, the only one I'm familiar with is an anthropological study 
of 155 traditional painters of Nathdwara, the pilgrim center near Udaipur, carried out in the 70s. Nine of the 13 of the most creative painters of this group reported having lost one or both parents by death before they were 10 years old. The relationship between the experience of loss and his art is ex expressed by one painter thus, and I quote him, but friend, you should understand one thing about me and my artistic works, that they are connected with the greatest sadness of my life. He then proceeds to tell the story of his mother, who he didn't give eight annas, 50 pesas for the younger members of the audience, and who died shortly afterward. And then he goes on to say, so there, no sorrow in this world is greater for me. Even nowadays, sometimes it comes back to me during my work. It happened while I was a little boy, but maybe all art is just for her. Because then every other problem in this world seems useless and insignificant compared to that. Indian aesthetic theories, theories of art, have been wonderful in elaborating the sun and light that make the lotus flower. My observations on Rabindranath's paintings is a modest attempt to redress the balance, to pay homage to the humble mud. To return to Rabindranath's paintings, for me, in these portraits, the old painter is not only mourning the losses of his childhood and youth, but also forgiving the boy, Robi, for his ambivalent feelings of being abandoned by the mother. For a child, a parent's death is first and foremost an abandonment. The portrait is being also compassionate with young Rabindranath's guilt at having betrayed the love of his life, Kadambri, as he now seeks to merge his own self-image with images of the two women. And in these fleeting moments of union with the dead women that he captures in his paintings, moments that combine the mud and sunlight, Rabindranath temporarily ascends existential loneliness and intimations of mortality even as he inexorably moves towards his own death, towards the death which Goethe called the eternal feminine. At the end, let me say that I disagree with Oscar Wilde when he remarks, to reveal art and conceal the artist is artist's aim. However imperfectly or blurred, art does reveal the artist. Thank you.